We have three different sports to talk about tonight as we broadcast live from Ball State University with Trevor Martin and Drew Baker. I'm Dominic Lanham and this is Cardinal Sports Live. This is Cardinal Sports Live. We're so back. We are so back. Let's go, I love it. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Before we get into the show, how are you guys feeling this evening? Dom, I'm feeling great. A little bit sentimental. This is our last show together for this year, but yep. obviously looking forward to the future with you guys and CSL as a whole. Yep. Let's get it going tonight. Yep. Yeah, a little bittersweet, but, you know, always excited to talk about sports with my guys. Exactly. Oh, of course. <laughs> We're going to start off the evening with men's volleyball. The Cards had their match against McKendry this past Saturday and had a final score of 3-2 to two with the Cards taking a win. What are your guys' thoughts on this? Yeah, Dom, honestly, it was an amazing comeback win for this team because if you were there, you saw it or you saw the highlights. This team was down 2-0 to oh after the first two sets, came back and had a reverse sweep, they call it, because you win the last three sets to come out with the win. Mm -hmm. Really impressive there, and with that win, took sole possession of the MIVA regular season title for the third straight season. Um, every set was impressive, too, because it was within five points except for that fifth set, which Ball State did win 15-8, to eight, but everything else, we were competitive throughout, and then, of course, at the end, kind of prevailed there, as we usually do at home. We've had a good home record, which we'll talk about um, yeah. in a future question. But, yeah, the one player to highlight from that match. Uh, Mr. T went off for a career high, career best for him, 27 kills along with three blocks and two aces as well. And with those 27 kills, that was his fourth 20 plus kill performance this season in, in a match. So really impressive for him. And also since it was the last uh, home MIVA regular season game, it was the uh, perfect way to send the seniors out on top uh, with now a record of 20 and nine and finishing 13 and three in the MIVA regular season. Really impressive win. Really liked how they you know sent that out on the right way. So really impressed with the performance and hopefully that can bode well. We'll get into the MIVA tournament in a second. Hopefully that bodes well yeah. for what they can do going forward. And Amoeba. Yeah, this win is a huge morale booster for the team, no doubt. First and foremost, like you said, they clinched first place in the Miva right above Loyola Chicago. I mean, what more can you ask for in conference play, you know? Uh, despite the slow start, definitely a slow start, Coach Cruz made those crucial adjustments to the lineup, and then the success on the court followed immediately after. The team actually finished with an attack percentage above 300, and we saw a lot of good things come from this game, even though, you know, despite the slow start, we saw a whole team involvement. Obviously, Mr. T carried a huge weight in that game, but the seniors pulled their weight. The freshmen showed out in the form of Lucas Machado. He had almost 40 assists in that game. Um, that freshman is having a monster season so far, but really just a great way to end out uh, the regular season. And I think the fact that it was a, a gritty 0-2 comeback, uh, it really just will do wonders for this team as they head into the MIVA quarterfinals. Yeah. What do you guys think about most of the MIVA tournament being hosted in Muncie at Worthen Arena? Yeah, I think it's crucial, Don, that you talk about to have th this home court advantage for any team, especially when it comes to volleyball, because we're kind of, you know, call ourselves the volleyball capital of the world, so when you can be at home inside Worthen, it's a big deal. And I know, kind of like you said in the question, kind of most of the tournament, yeah. because obviously the quarterfinals, I mean, Ball State should be hosting every match, but we don't have the entire tournament here, because the quarterfinals are at the higher seed of each opponent, so obviously we're hosting the eight seed, then, you know, two seed Loyola hosts the seven seed, so you kind of, that's how the structure works there. But then the semifinals and championship um, are hosted by the highest remaining seed, and I believe after the quarterfinals for the semifinals, the top four teams that make it are then reseeded into where they would be like one, two, three, and four. So yeah, Ball State, since we clinched the one seed like Drew talked about, and I did as well, if obviously if we keep winning, then we will keep hosting games inside Worth, and, and, and obviously going forward we will. Um, but as you, you know, talking about the home record, this team is 14-3 and three at home and 7-2 and two in the MIVA uh, as a home record as well. 6-6 six and six on the road, so that's where this team has struggled more. So I think that's even more of a reason why you want to host the MIVA tournament at every round that you can. And, and we will, of course, um, with having this 14-3 and three record through 17 matches at home. And also, we've had 10 of our uh, wins that have been sweeps this season have been at home as well. So obviously, when it comes down to it, we've won 14, but 10 of those 14 wins have been sweeps as well. So really, we've done an excellent job of commanding and dominating opponents when we've been at home. So I think hopefully that continues going forward as we'll get into, you know, some, you know, potential opponents in the next question. Yeah. I really think that this team is, yeah, plays well at home. That's really going to bode well for hopefully trying to, you know, do what we didn't do last year, win a Miva, Miva crown is what this yeah. team's hoping for. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you touched on the sweeps at home because those have been crucial for this team. If there's one thing that'll give this team an edge 
uh, during the Amoeba tournament, it's a home court advantage. Like you said, college volleyball, home court advantage is almost one of the best things that can happen for a team. Um, these guys are most comfortable playing at their home in Worthen Arena. Um, it reduces travel on the team, and it'll make it easier for them to find their groove, you know, find that rhythm on the court. Once you get into that groove, it's kind of hard to stop a team as successful as Ball State men's volleyball. Mm -hmm. I, I look at a match like McKendry. Obviously, Mr. T carried a heavy load in that game with almost 40 kills, but it also speaks to the other guys on the court, the support players, hitting their marks, doing their jobs, and putting Tanache in the position to put up those kind of numbers. So I think a home court advantage will definitely serve this team well, and I think they'll find success in the tournament, no doubt. Yeah. The Cardinals will be going against Queens University this Saturday in the first round of the MIVA tourney. What are your guys' predictions for this? Well, Dom, you said it. I really think, get your brooms out, everyone. I think this Queens team, you know, they're 9-20, and 20, just 2-14 and 14 in the MIVA. They're currently on a seven-game losing streak. And in this seven-game losing streak, they've had four losses that have been sweeps. The other three losses were 3-1, three to one, so they just can't compete. As you can see the graphic here, 9-20. and 20. But yeah, the kills per set, I mean, that is, you know, closer. Ball State about 13, Queens about 11. Uh, and then the digs per set, you know, Ball State just over nine, and then uh, obviously Queens there at eight. But I think, you know, in the matches we've had against in the season, they were both sweeps. That's why I feel confident in saying we can sweep them, because back on March 1st and March 3rd, we won 3-0 in both of those matches. And also in each set, won by an average of about six and a half or seven points per set. Um, and in those two matches, Ball State had 80 kills to Queens 67. Uh, the one advantage that Queens did have, though, was in digs. Uh, Queens had 62, Ball State had 55. But the final category that really, I think, kind of commands the presence of this team and what they've done this year is they had 19 blocks to Queens is just four. So you look at those kind of team numbers there, that really speaks volumes to what Ball State has done all year. And the Queens, obviously, you know, kind of a new program to the Miva, weren't there last year. So uh, you know, credit to them for getting to this level, but I think they're gonna run to, you know, a real, a real buzzsaw in, in Ball State volleyball. And I think they'll improve to 21 and nine and then get to the Miva semifinals for the second straight season yeah. after they can hopefully take care of Queens and hopefully in a sweeping fashion as I said it. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if this first round is a preview of anything, uh, it's a preview of the Ball State success that they found against Queens earlier in the season. Like Trevor said, back-to-back 3-0 -back sweeps against Queens earlier this year. And between those two matches, Ball State hit over 360, had a combined 19 blocks. And in the second match, once again, the freshman Lucas Machado came out in a big way. He had 30 assists and six blocks. So you take those numbers, you combine it with the home court advantage, uh, the patterns of Mr. T coming off a career high performance, and the fact that Queens is in the midst of a seven game losing streak. I think Ball State has an opportunity to come out strong in the first round of the tournament and really just set the tone for the entire thing. Yeah. Do you guys think we have a chance of winning the championship in the MIVA tourney? Yeah, Tom, I think we definitely have a chance. I think it's just going to take a lot from this team to, you know, get past the likes of Loyola and, of course, Ohio State, the you know, defending MIVA champions from last year. But to look at that you know, real quick, Ball State is a, has a 3-1 and one combined record against both Loyola and Ohio State, and the lone loss was actually a sweep here at home against Ohio State, which didn't happen for us very often. Obviously, we only had three home losses all season, um, but that was, of course, one of those uh, bad losses there in a sweep against Ohio State. But we beat them, I believe it was a five-set match, uh, you know, a couple days before then in, the, you know, in Columbus, and then they just came here and kind of took care of business. Um, but the other thing, too, when we look at the semifinals the next game um, potentially if we can get past Queens um, we actually were 4-0 in the two or the four times we played Lindenwood and Purdue Fort Wayne that's the 4-5 matchup so kind of a toss-up as to who would win that but looking at that Ball State has been able to win both of those matches as well so a combined you look at that there now seven and one against teams that we would potentially play in the semifinals and then the championship as well so I feel confident that this team Again, they got to that level last year, played against Ohio State, lost in the championship, so I really think this can be a complete 180 moment. They can get to that championship, and if it's against Ohio State, that'd be perfect to see if we can you know, really do a complete 180 from last year. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, looking at like it might be, Loyola, might, might be Loyola too, I think that you know, with it being at home inside Worthen Arena, I really think that plays to the advantage of this team and why I think that they can hopefully, re uh, not repeat, but get to the championship again and then win it this year yeah. uh, next Saturday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have no doubt this team could win the tournament. Um, even when this team has faced adversity this year, they, they battled. The court chemistry is there. I look at the McKendry match again. They were behind two, two sets, and they still came back and won. You know, the seniors showed out. The freshmen showed out. The court chemistry was there. Um, the support players were doing their jobs. You mix into that Worthen Arena and the home court advantage. Uh, the Cardinal fans, the friends, the family that are definitely going to come out to support the, the MIVA tournament. I have no doubt. That would be amazing if they played Ohio State, kind of like a re redemption mm -hmm. match, you know, a, a get-back game. But, yeah, I have no doubt they have every every chance to win this tournament. Yeah. Baseball had a series against Miami this past weekend following with non-conference preparation and a preview of the Akron series this weekend. We'll get into that next. 
My name is Gary Parker. I served as a Cavalry Scout and a military policeman in the United States Army for 20 years. When I was a Cavalry Scout, we had a young lieutenant that came in, great guy, but he moved on, got promoted to lieutenant colonel, went on to Afghanistan, and I was able to keep in contact. And I'd wake up one morning, go on social media, and there's that post you don't want to see. For whatever reason, he, he took his own life. Nobody knows why he did it. And if there's something that we could have done to prevent it from happening, safe gun storage can prevent gun suicide because it's that added step to get to your firearm that might just give somebody a moment of reflection on what they're doing. As a veteran, we need to be ambassadors to people that don't have the knowledge that we have. Anytime you're not storing a weapon safely, you're putting yourself and your community at risk. Service never stops. Victor deployed for the first time to Afghanistan in 2003. He sustained a moderate traumatic brain injury. Basically, he had to relearn everything. One of the most important elements of caregiving is taking care of yourself. We have our own journey, and we can fulfill that journey at the same time that we are helping our loved one. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for a free military veteran's guide to navigate your caregiving journey. Multiple studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. It's here. It's here. Wait, wait, wait. What? I can't drive. What? What? My. Oh. <laughs> Let's move over to baseball here on CSL. The Cards had a series against Miami this past weekend with BSU winning two out of the three games they played. What's your take on this? Yeah, we really looked impressive through the first two games to extend our win streak to what was then eight games at, that, at one point before getting blown out. So kind of a bad way to end that to, I guess, hopefully not start a losing streak, but to lose the first one and, and nine games there. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, as you look at the kind of the scores, I'll break that down real quick. One, three to two, uh, first game on Saturday, then two to oh on Saturday, and then lost 11 to one then on Sunday in eight innings. So I guess getting run rule towards the end of that game didn't go the full nine innings there. Mm -hmm. um, but what I want to mention is the very consistent pitching in the first two wins that we had. We only used four total pitchers in our two wins, but then unfortunately we used five there in that 11 to one loss. So kind of, and that's usually the, the trend when you lose baseball games typically you have to use a lot more pitchers because they're not having success and they're getting a lot of hits and getting the bats going against you so that's definitely was the, the negative side but the one player I want to talk about is Keegan Johnson he had the most impressive outing on Saturday afternoon in that win against Miami pitched in six innings uh, faced 23 batters 91 total pitches but in that effic efficiency there he had 10 strikeouts just three walks gave up just two hits as well so he probably would have had the most impressive performance on the mound all weekend of the three starting pitchers we saw. I mean, of course, Merritt Beaker we've talked about before, and he looked impressive in that game on Friday and to get the win there. But I would say Keegan Johnson, the freshman the lefty, looked really impressive there for Ball State. So these are the kind of games, you know, in the wins we had winning by one run and then two runs, those are the kind of wins you need in the season to then hopefully, you know, in the MAC tournament. And then hopefully if this team wants to make it to the NCAA regional like they did last year, you need to kind of win these kind of games that are close like this. So, yeah, right now sitting at 7-8 in the MAC, not the best record you want to see. But I think hopefully we'll get to the Akron series here in a future question. But I think that um, definitely this team's looking good to start. Yeah. Yeah, like Coach Maloney said in a post-game interview, winning the series is always their first main objective. Um, but dropping that third game by 10 runs, it's going to sting a little bit for sure, especially when you have a nice little win streak going. Uh, it's not all bad, though. They picked up their 20th win on the season. That's a good milestone to hit midway through. Um, and carrying an eight-game win streak midway through the season, it really just shows what type of ball these guys are playing, where their minds are at, and what kind of coaching is going down. Uh, but, yeah, definitely what stuck out to me was the pitching. I have to hit on Keegan Johnson once again. He was one strikeout away from tying his career high of 11 strikeouts against Toledo, and now he has a 4-0 record on the year. So pitching has been leading the charge for this Ball State baseball team um, as of late, and we'll see if they can take that success into this Akron series coming up. Yeah. How do midweek non-conference games help prepare for Max series on the weekends? Yeah, I think, you know, the big thing actually when, you know, before we knew this game was going to be canceled, we were going to talk about this IU game that was supposed to happen on Tuesday. Yeah. Got, they got canceled due yeah. to weather. Um, but I'd, I would say they really are extremely helpful because you've got the chance to go against, you know, for Ball State, you got Big East, 
Big Ten, ACC opponents throughout the whole season. So, you know, we've already defeated Michigan State this year 4-1, to one, beat Illinois 7-1, to one, Butler 7-6, to six, and then Bellarmine 7-2. to two. So just teams like that, I think, can help prepare you. As you can see, yeah, the standings there for this team, obviously, Ball State, you know, not where they'd want to be yeah. sitting at 7-8 and eight there, but hopefully, yeah, this series will get to the, in the next question. will hopefully bode well for that. But on the season still, have a game at Purdue uh, against IU at Victory Field, which will be a fun one there, uh, next Tuesday on the 23rd. to be a fun game to have, you know, Ball State, of course, playing yeah. at Victory Field there. And then also we have a series at NC State in a couple weeks, then a home game against Butler and Indiana State. So still some time there for those non-conference games. Kind of a, you know, there's less pressure there, of course, because you're not having to compete against MAC opponents. But I think when you, you know, Coach Maloney and the whole athletic department, you schedule these good, you know, quality opponents, and they obviously, you know, throughout the week there, so you don't have as much time, you know, weekend to weekend between the MAC series. You need to have those games on a Tuesday, Wednesday night, things mm -hmm. like that. So I really think that, that the success they've had is, of course, one thing to think of, but then how that kind of bodes well for the MAC season, I think is good. Sometimes maybe you don't, you know, pitch your aces until the weekend, but I think it's good to get the other playmakers and making sure you do the great job because you want to continue to improve your record. Yeah. Not as much pressure as MAC games, but it's still good going forward to have exactly. you know, that kind of momentum in those non-conference yeah. games. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Ball State, they've been finding a lot of success with these non-conference games. Four of the five games in the middle of the week that they've played, they've come out with a W. Um, not only does that give you momentum heading into the weekend, playing the conference MAC opponents, um, but it allows the team to play all levels of competition, get a variety of uh, caliber of teams that you're playing against. Like you said, when they schedule uh, those opponents, that's what they're looking for to really diversify the schedule every single year. Um, it was kind of a bummer that Indiana game was canceled. Uh, that could have been a good chance for them to prove themselves on the road in Bloomington. And that Hoosier team, very beatable. They are barely over 500 on the year. So, um, But this team does have another chance against Purdue to pick up a Big Ten win. Currently 1-1 one one against Big Ten competition this year. Uh, but obviously the, first, the focus first goes to this Akron three-game series yeah. this weekend. Yep. The Cardinals have a three-game series against Akron this upcoming weekend here in Muncie. What are your guys' predictions for these three games? Well, guys, I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. I think we can get those brooms out once again. <laughs> Akron's a team right now struggling. They're just 1-11 in the MAC, 6-25 on the whole season, and they're just 2-13 on the road, currently 11 out of 11 teams in the MAC. Uh, and their lone MAC win actually came back on St. Patrick's Day. They had a 2-1 to win against Northern Illinois, but I don't know about you guys, but I don't think St. Patrick's making an appearance in Muncie, so I think it could be a long weekend for this Zips team. You know, on this six-game MAC losing streak, Four of those losses have been by five or more runs, two of them by ten or more runs. I know, of course, Ball State's a team that you know, just lost by ten runs to Miami, but that just adds motivation. You were on the road, and to flip things back to exactly. being at home as well. And looking at last year, obviously a different team, but you can look at what Ball State did. They went 2-1 and one at Akron last year. Their first game, they lost 4-0, to zero, but then came back with an 11-6 to six win and then a commanding 9-1 to one win. So they did a great job finishing the weekend last year against Akron. So and Akron as a team last year, finished 10th of 11 teams, finished just 12-18 and 18 in the MAC. So have been struggling the last couple years, but Ball State, of course, you know, didn't, well, I think it was the, maybe the three seed, I believe, last year in the MAC tournament, um, but then obviously won the MAC tournament. So you kind of have that target on your back, but I think this team, you know, Ball State's batting average right now sitting at 282, have uh, 46 home runs through the season, 377 on base percentage, 28 stolen bases as well. So some pretty quick guys on the team as well. So I really think this team should be able to win all three against that. Yeah. On paper, Ball State should have this game in the bag, but if there's one sport that's so unpredictable, it's basketball and then baseball because yeah. it's never truly over until it's over, until the fat lady sings. You know, the Zips only have six wins on the season, but a couple of really respectable ones against Illinois, Big Ten, and Duke who is currently ranked seven in the country. So although it might seem like it, it's definitely not a sleeper series. And I'm curious to see if Ball State can continue that pitching success that they saw against Miami. Yeah. Next, we'll be talking about track and fields. We fly challenge this weekend, along with who to keep an eye on during the challenge and how special this home meet is right after this. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a mile, mile in my, my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes. I'm an ex drug dealer, and I'll be your sub today. Two milligrams of fentanyl can be lethal. A lethal dose is in here. Who gets it, I won't know. It's cheap, it's potent, and it's profitable. The sad reality is fentanyl is being mixed into everything now. More kitchen now. 
Here at Cardinal Sports Live, we like to strive for perfection because we want to make sure we're giving out the best quality possible for our viewers. That's why I've gone out and hired a official, a referee, you might say, to implement rules and violations that he sees. Are you kidding me? You gotta focus up that camera. Th that's not how it should look. I love my new job. I get to make bad calls all day. This is what I live for. This is awesome. Now I like to think that this new rule enforcer has been a great help for the show. I've seen a lot of great feedback. I hate him. Yeah, no, this is absolutely terrible. And with all that said, that's why I've chosen Peyton Sparks as the Cardinals athlete of the year. You know, I think that's a really good pick, but I think the obvious choice here is Carson Steele. I mean, you look at his numbers. No, 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 no. You guys are both wrong here. They're not even athletes here anymore. They say you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, and with this new rule enforcer, I think we could take a lot more shots. Are you kidding me? What, are you, what is this? Oh, did, did you just hit the reset button too? I, I that's said, a that, terrible place. That's the worst thing you can do though, because it resets the whole thing. Welcome back to Corona Sports Live. I'm Dominic and I am joined by Trevor and Drew. Track and Field has their We Fly Challenge this weekend here in Muncie. What are you guys looking forward into in this meet? I'm really looking for a strong showing in every really aspect of this meet because you know we competed last weekend at the Tennessee Relays. Really saw a lot of success in Knoxville, so I'm hoping that conti can continue for this team. You know, two athletes I'm not going to talk about in the next question, but I want to talk about here is had the some of their personal best. Sydney Miller uh, had a discus throw at it in the nearly 44 meters. I think it was 43.89, um, securing third place for her personally. And then Sarah Monin Smith ran the 1500 meters uh, in 433.02 to finish seventh for her personal best as well. So I think two of those athletes to kind of pin point had the personal best so hopefully they're looking to continue that I know obviously we'll get to how special this is with it being the only home meet but I think yeah. they've built some success with the Tennessee Relays I think they can continue that for this coming weekend you know here in Muncie yeah. for the We Fly Challenge like we talked about. Yep. Yeah just to touch on the Tennessee Relays once again <coughs> very successful meet uh, Miller and Mon and Smith with their PRs and also Ella Fulmer ran a 20 second PR in the 5,000 meters so awesome. that's definitely a, a really impressive personal best um, so this team coming off of those Tennessee Relays has a lot of a lot of momentum in their corner coming into the only home meet of the season. If this year is anything like last year's We Fly Challenge, um, I think this team can su expect a lot of success. Granted, there were a lot of seniors on the team last year. Um, they still pulled off several event wins, and so we'll see if they can continue that success going into this home meet this yeah. year. How special is this only home meet for the track team during the outdoor season? I think it's really special because it's actually the only home meet in 18 meets they have, including the indoor season and, of course, the outdoor season as well, yeah. um, including both of the MAC championships for the indoor and outdoor, too. So I just think that's why, you know, obviously you're not every weekend, but, you're, you know, you're traveling to Knoxville, you're traveling to, you know, Ypsilanti or Kalamazoo, Michigan, just kind of, you know, you're kind of everywhere. So when you have one weekend, it's just, okay, we don't have to travel, don't get on a bus. I mean, we love the team chemistry, but when you can be here, be home, have, you know, some fans come. I mean, I think that's just what adds a lot to it because you can put on some of your best performances, you know, like we talked about Drew and I talked about some PRs that these girls had. I think that hopefully, why would you see anything less than that for this coming weekend against, you know, some quality opponents, you know, coming in for, but I think that it's just more motivation to try to win it, of course, outright, but at least to compete in every event that you're in. If you're in a three or four or five events, you're just trying to always continue to boost yourself up, get as good as you can. And I think that we'll see that when you're in front of your home fans for the only time all year, you want to make sure that that's the meet. If there's no meet, you know, you're going to try to get a PR for, which they are always doing that, of course. But I think this is the one to really focus in on that I think they can do and have success with. Yeah, yeah I think this team is only going to benefit from a home meet. Not only are they most comfortable running on their own track, but it gives them the best chance to honor the seniors, first and foremost, show out in front of their Cardinal fans, the friends, the family. And like you said, in the past four weeks, this team has been all around the country. They've been to Tampa, Austin, Texas, Raleigh, North Carolina, a lot of travel, and that comes with being a D1 athlete, but it definitely gets, gets exhausting after a while, it takes a toll on the body. Um, so I think these athletes are going to definitely take advantage of a home meet and uh, recognize their seniors before they leave in the fall. Yeah. Who do we need to keep an eye on this week and at the We Fly Challenge? Yeah, the one I'm going to talk about, I think, you know, I feel like Drew and I have kind of both mentioned her before, but Jenna Oriani, you know, because last weekend at the Tennessee Relays, kind of mentioned her there. Yeah, she uh, placed second in the 4 by 100 meter relay, as you can see on that graphic, with a 45.41 time, so really good for her. That was her best performance, but also had a couple other top 10 finishes. She was sixth in the 200 meters with a 24.18 uh, time, and finally she was seventh in the 400 meter dash with a time of 55.3. So really impressive there all around for her. Um, I really think, you know, the junior sprinter, She's been great all year. I think we'll cons cons uh, see another successful weekend for her. I mean, obviously, all those three events really quick. And obviously, the, you know, the four by one, you got the baton in there. I think she's the, maybe the anchor um, for that leg of that. But yeah, she really has been impressive. And she's been getting top tens all season. I really think we'll see nothing less from her. And we'll see her compete at a high level and hopefully maybe secure first place in any of these events or at least for sure get another top five, top ten finish this weekend. Yep. My athlete to watch out for in this meet is Alana Springer. She's a sophomore uh, sprinter. 
over the course of the season, she's steadily gotten better and better. Um, at the Tennessee relay uh, meet, her 4x100 meter relay team finished second. And that same team actually <coughs> won the event last year in the We Fly Challenge. So uh, Springer, she's a regular top finisher in the 200 meter dash. And even though she's only a sophomore and underclassman, she has a lot of experience. She's very good at what she does. And I think she could play a huge role in this upcoming meet. Yep. Next up, we'll be closing out the semester with our Cardinal Moments of the Year. Stick with us. We'll be back in 60 seconds. Today, we face an unprecedented crisis. Tens of millions of refugees have been forced from their homes. But you can make a difference. Turn disruption and despair into hope and opportunity. Even small amounts make a big difference. Provide shelter, support, or jobs in your community. The more we understand, the greater sense of belonging we create. Act now. Visit supportcrisisrelief.org. We are back on TSO, and with tonight being the last show of the semester for this crew, we're going to be giving you our Cardinal Moments of the Year. I'll go ahead and start with mine. I have Allie Becky's game winner against Georgia. It was an amazing shot, and it is also up for Cardinal Moment of the Year at the Chirpies, which is April 22nd at Worthen Arena. But overall, this was an amazing shot, and it was very cool to witness. Trevor, what's your Cardinal Moment of the Year? It's, I'm going to have to agree with you. I think you're going to talk about what she's going to get to that in a second, but like this, the success the whole team's had, obviously. But yeah. I think that moment kind of you know, started the started things going, and I totally agree with you there. Mm -hmm. But my Cardinal Moment of the Year, I'm going to go still in the vein of uh, women's sports here, but I'm going to pick McKenna Holland and her Sports Center top 10 catch against Kennesaw State back on February 23rd, so quite a while ago. Um, but it was a spectacular diving grab at second base. If you haven't seen it yet, I think it's on her Instagram, and probably, I think on Ball State Sports, they probably pinned that somewhere as well. Um, and it was, you know, she's just a redshirt sophomore, so hopefully we can see some more highlight reel catches from her. And her career she wears number one so obviously I think she knows how good she is and so I think if we can, can see you know some more from her um, in Ball State you know of course you know not a team always in the spotlight the other top 10 play we've had this year was a negative one as it was the you know the, the, the uh, buzzer beater against Western Michigan which our own Ryan Siraki did get the shot of which but obviously it's on the negative side of that so your top 10 play I think was number 10 but again against a team that you know we lost to so to have a highlight reel in, in, the, in the right way is something I wanted to see so uh, I think hopefully her, her fantastic defensive play will continue and I think that moment of the year really stands out to me because it was that top 10 play that made it on national TV on ESPN. Yeah. Of the sports we've covered this year, I've got to say my favorite team to cover was probably women's basketball. Um, they had a 14 game win streak in the middle of the season. Uh, and I just, that team was truly something special this year. I, I think it was probably the best women's basketball team this school has seen in, in a while. Um, although the things didn't really pan out for them towards the end of the season, the postseason, the tournament, things didn't go their way. Something that's undeniable is that this team brought energy and it brought excitement back to Ball State basketball. It brought energy back to Worthen Arena. You know, there was a, a two month span of time where you could turn on CBS and you could be watching Ball State compete against other teams. So it was just a, a fun time overall. And I, I do have to give a little uh, honorable mention for my Cardinal moment of the year. And it was one of the first football games of the year. Ball State football holding the Georgia Bulldogs scoreless in the first quarter. The reigning champs, it almost made my cut for the top spot, but, um, you know, we got thumped by 42 points after that. So, yeah, <laughs> my moment of the year, women's basketball overall, the 14-game win streak, middle of the season. You can't beat it. It was just such an electric team to watch every single game, in and out, every player, Ali Becky, like we talked about. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. such a fun team to watch. So that's my Cardinal exactly. team of the year, I suppose. Yeah. And I think just to kind of wrap things up, guys, I'm obviously, you know, I was kind of the returning guys. You guys came in and did a great job. So yeah. I just want to thank you guys for the semester and exactly. obviously the year we've had because we've been on since the fall. So, you know, I kind of, one of the guys, my other analyst graduated, and then uh, other guy, Isaiah Rosner, directed a few of our shows but didn't host. So having yeah. you guys th with me this semester has been awesome. And obviously, I'll be it's seeing you next year. Amazing. But looking forward to yeah, continuing yeah. with you guys if you're continuing with us. And I'm so, so looking forward to the potential we have uh, yeah. together as a crew, maybe, and down the road. Appreciate you guys yeah. a lot. Of course.
That would do it for this week's edition of Cardinal Sports Live. Our season finale and senior show will be next week. We appreciate everyone who is watching tonight and has been watching us this entire school year. A huge thank you to everyone back in the studio and a big thank you to producer Nolan Bolman and R director Ryan Saraki who will be graduating in May. We appreciate you both for what you have done for CSL and we look forward to seeing you guys succeed in your careers. For Drew Baker and Trevor Martin, I'm your host Dominic Lamb saying go long, so long for now and good night from Muncie.